last couple of classes have been setting up the situation, talking about wildcrafting, talking about plant identification, uh, and an introduction. And now we're going to start talking about how to set up a first aid kit for traveling. I want to say that none of this is theoretical for me. All the different kinds of first aid kits that I'm talking about, all the different plants I'm talking about, are things that I've used very regularly. Uh, as stories come up, I'll bring them out. But as I also said a while ago, if you want to practice first aid, there's one basic thing to do, and that is to have a first aid bag on you as often as possible. So you don't have to have it in your day pack or something, but maybe in your car, or if you go someplace where you know people might hurt themselves, festivals or parties or music scenes, if you have a first aid bag and a little bit of knowledge, you'll find that you'll probably start treating people right away and you'll start accruing uh, experience. So what I want to start out doing is talking about some very basic tools to have in every first aid bag. And then I want to cover some basic safety protocols. At one point, uh, if you really want to practice in a more deliberate fashion, you're going to, uh, I would suggest taking a more advanced first aid class, because more advanced first aid classes teach you some very basic stuff that I, I won't cover here. But some of the basic stuff will be covered right now. So in this section, I want to start off by talking about some basic uh, safety equipment, basic gear to have on you, and also some basic safety protocols. And then we'll talk about specific first aid bags. The first thing I would suggest in putting any first aid kit together at all is disposable gloves. Right Before you put tinctures in there, before you put band-aids in there, get some disposable gloves and just put them. And they're very light. Make sure they fit your hand size. Uh, my hands are medium sized, uh, but uh, large gloves barely fit them. So just make sure that they fit you. Because at one point, you're going to start working with the, one of the most common first aid circumstances, and that's people bleeding. So it makes a lot of sense to protect yourself and them from passing fluids back and forth. And here we're talking about blood, which is, could definitely have infectious material. So remember, it's two ways. So I'm talking about putting disposable gloves in your first aid kit. And it's two ways of possible infection. It's not just them infecting you. And by infecting you, I mean they have whatever bacteria or virus in them that you potentially get, but you also might have been working with other people in a first aid circumstance, and now you're working with somebody else who's bleeding, and you have it on your skin, and you haven't changed any gloves or washed, and you can also help make other people sick. So please be conscientious about passing any fluids back and forth, and the easiest way to prevent that is just disposable gloves. A word on disposability. I think in most of our lives, and I'm talking to a group here, that probably were pretty conscientious about not just throwing everything away, if possible, to recycle stuff, if possible, uh, you know, to reuse stuff. That stops happening in first aid, in first aid circumstances, uh, where there's possible in contamination and spreading of infections, it's really important to throw things away properly. When I work at the rainbow gathering or large gatherings, we actually mark all the medical waste from other bags, because people often recycle stuff and we'll go through all the waste that passes through the main garbage area. And so we want to make sure that if it has potential infectious disease, uh, that that doesn't uh, get recycled, that it just gets thrown out. And there's ways of disposing of medical waste. So the first thing is disposable gloves. They're really inexpensive. Buy a box of them, share them with your friends. If you get bored, you can blow them up into weird balloons. There's all kinds of things one could do with disposable gloves. You, I'm sure some of you have excellent imaginations, and even now, you are thinking of new, inventive ways to use disposable gloves. So I want to talk about the basic, basic, basic safety parameter, and that is avoid hurting other people and yourself further. So before we talk about treating people at all, your basic safety guideline is how to prevent more harm to anybody around you. So there's the patients around you, there's other people, maybe first aid workers, for me students, and then yourself. How to avoid furthering harm. In other words, how to not make sure anybody gets infected 
or if there's any kind of dangerous situations. That, but, um, so as opposed to how do you treat people, the goal is how do you do the least amount of harm and help the person the most. So I'm going to read a list of what I consider some basic things to have in most first aid bags. We're going to talk about different first aid bags in a bit, but right now these are all general ones. Um, they're in alphabetical order, so they're not in order of importance. And later we're going to be panning a run bag. A run bag is a common, is the name of a bag that you take with you on first aid runs. So a bandana is a very helpful thing. The reason a bandana, you can use it as a cloth, but you can also use a bandana as a respiratory mask if you have to look down people's throats who might, if, if you're looking to see if they have sore throats or strep throats, you just tie a bandana on um, and then you can always just wash it later. Uh, so I find the bandana very helpful for that in particular. Also, if you're working in dusty areas, you can wear the bandana over your nose and mouth um, to not breathe in just a lot of dust. So both of those are very handy. If you do first aid protest work, in other words, if you go do street medicine and gases get released into the streets, it's a tiny bit of protection, not too much really. There's ways of working with that. We'll talk about street medic work in a bit. The next thing is a cell phone. Many areas that you'll be doing wilderness work, cell phones don't do anything. But in anything that's not wilderness, having a cell phone means that you have access to 911 or people that you know, or calling up somebody who's having um, a mental health issue, and you get their family, you can contact them and figure out what to do in that situation. So cell phones, or just phones, and along with phones, if you know you're going to be doing first aid in a specific area, get your emergency numbers. So for instance, when we go to rainbow gatherings, this year it's in Washington State. Once we know where it is in Washington State, we'll have the emergency numbers for the local hospital. So if we need an emergency, we have that number. You don't have to look it up. It can just take more time. So emergency numbers. The next you don't really have to have, and it's kind of expensive, but it's really handy if you need it, and that's an EpiPen. Later on, we're going to talk about shock and what's called anaphylaxis. That's the bad reaction some people have when they get stung by a bee. There's no replacement. Uh, they're about $60 or $70. They last about two years. You need a prescription. But all that said, usually you can get the prescription pretty easily. So if you have an EpiPen uh, on you at all times, that means if somebody goes into anaphylactic shock, which is that whole thing when people have trouble breathing, and their blood pressure drops, and it can definitely lead to death, you have something on hand. If you're a nurse, you can just do it in the little ampules that the epinephrine comes into, but for most people, it's going to be an EpiPen. Uh, flashlights. I would have at least two flashlights in any first aid kit. Many accidents happen at night. And sometimes you're also looking in the back of people's throats. So I would recommend as a headlamp, you don't need the clunky one I have, but some kind of headlamp. So if you have to do some wilderness medicine, if you just have to go, whether it's a music event and that's at night or a party, if you have to walk someplace, you have your hands free and have a small headlamp, uh, like an LED light. So that would be one thing. And then I would have a small one of those little mag lights, I'll show them in a little bit, uh, to look in people's throats and to uh, check out wounds with those lights. So two flashlights, small headlamp and a small flashlight um, for, both, for both checking out people's wounds and finding your way in the dark. Next uh, is a respiratory mask. If you know you're going to be working around a lot of people that potentially have colds or flus or sore throats and you'd be looking down people's throats, um, I would suggest just getting those disposable respiratory masks rather than a bandana just for cleanliness. They're just cloth masks that go around the nose and the mouth. They have pieces that go around your ears. Last two things. Uh, which seem pretty obvious, but sometimes get forgotten. The first is snacks. It's just you are a human being. I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're a human being. And if you're an alien, hello to all aliens in the audience, uh, that you're going to get hungry. You're going to get hungry. Friends are going to get hungry, but really just for you. I suggest getting a, your not favorite snack to carry with you. So for instance, I like peanut butter, but I don't love peanut butter but it really lasts well. If, and if I get really hungry, I have the peanut butter stash someplace for me to eat. The reason I'm saying not your favorite food is you'll just gobble it up. So if I bring dried mangoes, this is personal here, my dried mangoes, no matter how hungry I am, will be gone in about two days because I just like eating them. On the other hand, the peanut butter will be there to the end because I get pretty bored with peanut butter. So I suggest having a snack that you really like 
uh, but you won't just eat because you like its flavor that much. But really, I'm telling you, please have snacks for you, have snacks for other people. If you have students, have snacks for them, but mostly for yourself. And the second is a corollary to snacks, and that is water. You're going to be getting thirsty a lot. You're going to be in situations where you, if, you're, if somebody gets sick in front of you, you're working, and it's the middle of the day, and all of a sudden somebody, two or three people come in, let's say, with bad diarrhea. And you have to watch them because you're worried that maybe it's some kind of food poisoning going around. So all of a sudden you can't leave, and you're thirsty. So please carry water with you, some clean drinking water. So you have snacks to eat and water to drink because it's very easy to get cranky doing first aid. I mean, you're in charge, there's a lot of responsibility. When I mentioned the rainbow gathering before, to a lot of people, they go to the rainbow gathering and do yoga and drumming and other things I avoid uh, all the time. So instead, I'm doing first aid. And so I like doing first aid. I mean, it's, for me, it's the thing I would like to do, but it does mean that instead of enjoying myself and looking at plants or hanging out with people, that I'm basically smelling vomit and I'm looking at snot and I'm listening to people who are in a lot of pain due to toothaches. And so it's just, you learn to put up your boundaries and slough that stuff off. But you just want your basic things that are important for your personal health. And water and snacks are really there. And then other things we could talk about is just the herbs that you like to take to relax. So th that's it. Those are the basic things that I think everybody should have. Some other uh, equipment and supplies that I would suggest would be medicine making supplies. So this is on just a general first aid rule. Wild crafting tools, those were both covered a little bit. And also consider the clothes that you're wearing. So depending on where you are, it can be really important to just have the right clothes. Personally, I like those synthetic shirts that if I sweat in a lot, they dry pretty fast. If they get wet, they dry pretty quick. And if they get dirty, they're really easy to clean. So whatever you like to wear is helpful, but I like those long sleeve uh, synthetic shirts and also actually the synthetic pants. Um, but they're just black colored, what a coincidence. Um, so fashionable enough, especially if I wear a bandana. So I have my black synthetic shirt, my black synthy pants, but my cotton black bandana, and I'm all ready for first aid. Uh, so I wear long sleeve shirts because I like to be covered up for wind and for rain and also for excess sun. Because sometimes you'll get called out to a situation in first aid where you're out in a big field and you're not going to have any protection and you're going to start to get sunburned. So I recommend if, you can, if you're okay with it is wearing a long sleeve shirt. I also, so a lot of this is personal, of course. I also like to wear denim jackets. And I like denim jackets, honestly, because it gives me a sense of protection. That I like the feel of them. I like all the inside pockets. I've had people sew more inside pockets for my jacket, so it just acts like a vest as well. So again, long sleeved, protective in case anything goes wrong, protective against the weather. But honestly, I'm just around a lot of people. And you will be around a lot of people, too. And there's something about, like, you're a snuggly blanket or something. And so my denim jacket is like that for me. It's just something I feel comfortable and a little bit protected in while I'm working with sick people. And people accompanying sick people and all. The, it's a much bigger milieu than just uh, the person and you and the sickness. Uh, I would suggest a hat. It's just, especially if you have longer hair, but something to keep the hair off your, out of your face. Uh, I would suggest tying your hair back. And I wear a baseball hat, but any hat that's good sun protection. And also, once again, just protecting the top of your head um, and keeping hair out useful. Uh, I, I wear closed toed shoes. I just wear regular runners. None of these things are very fancy. Maybe my sh synthetic shirts are a little bit fancy. Maybe synthetic pants as well. The rest of it though are pretty common items. Uh, not very expensive. And so I really like to have you know just regular runners for shoes formerly called sneakers. Uh, just in case something falls on my foot. If I have to run someplace so that my feet are protected so I have socks and shoes on. So basically, nothing special. I'm wearing a hat, I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, I'm wearing a long sleeve jacket, I'm wearing long sleeved pants, I'm wearing socks and shoes, 
and that's pretty good. I don't have to wear any special shoes. In fact, I don't like heavy shoes because I'm in them all day long, so I'd like to have something a little bit lighter. And these days, there's lots of inexpensive, really well-made shoes that I find. You know, also, I tend to go for them with ankle support. So that's, that's my clothing debriefing on Herbal First Aid. You probably weren't expecting a whole thing on clothing and styles. But maybe later on, I'll have me and some of the apprentices in this room, we will, uh, show, we will show off our fashionista sense of first aid clothing styles. I want to mention um, three, I want to mention sanitation. So I've already been covering this lightly and talking about disposable gloves and about um, getting rid of medical waste. I just want to say there's kind of three parts of sanitation that are important. So we're still kind of in equipment and basic outlines for safety protocols. The first is personal hygiene or personal sanitation when you're working with people. A lot of the work that I do is outdoors, and I get pretty dirty. First, I'm gathering plants, and I'm working with people, and I tend to squat in the dirt often. But I wash up pretty regularly, and I would say for the majority of people that I work with, and not including, not including the official people that sometimes show up when I'm doing outdoor first aid work, but just patience is if I'm a little bit cleaner, and by, I'm wearing all this clothes, so you can't see what's underneath the clothes but my hands and my face constantly get washed. Not thoroughly washed and my face not always with soap, but you know, I mean, I'm just getting, over the course of hours, I just get dirtier and dirtier, especially in outdoor situations, once again, like protest medicine or uh, outdoor events. So I like to have a presentation of, that I'm thinking about who I am. I'm thinking about my presentation. And so I would say, even though a lot of people talk about liking being dirty, I love being dirty, but I feel like when people come to me, their confidence level goes up a little bit if, they, if they're presented with a slightly cleaner version of me. I don't wear white jackets. White jackets would be crazy for me. They'd be thoroughly dirty and I would look like some kind of raving mad scientist. So instead, I just keep myself basically clean looking. Um, but also, I wash my hands and you should wash your hands constantly when you're working in first aid or any health care. I'm going to say that again. You should be constantly washing your hands with soap and water. You can also do those evaporative antibacterial rinses, but I don't like, I don't like putting that gel on my hands. I like water and soap. And do it often. Uh, if you've been following the news lately, um, this is May of 2011. There's been some very interesting studies, not really that interesting in common sense, that one of the main reasons pathogens are spread in hospitals is from doctors and nurses not washing their hands as often as they should. And it make, it's just hard to, because you just, you know, you're running from person to person to person. But the reality is, it's a really quick way to pass diseases. You work with one person, they have whatever set of germs, and then you give it to the next person. So you can just bring hand sanitizer, that's the name of the gel, or just soap and water. But you should really not only have a clean appearance just to make people feel a little uh, at ease, but also just to make sure that you're not passing diseases back and forth to yourself and to others. There's environmental cleanliness. And first aid stations, notoriously, get messy fast. You know, all of a sudden two or three people come in, there's only a few of you on staff, and everybody's opening bandages and opening cold packs and hot packs and taking out medicines. But it's important to clean it up, not just from a sanitation point of view, but from an organizational point of view. Because you might have a rush of people, but if you are already set up, you can deal with that rush of people, then as soon as that's over, clean it up again. Also though, making sure that you get rid of any potential pathogens. If you have any if people have vomited, there could be stuff in there. If anybody's had a bowel movement where they shouldn't have, and it definitely happens, right? P diarrhea is a very common circumstance. So they might poop and wipe themselves really close by just because they had no control, they had urgency to their diarrhea. You have to make sure that stuff is clean. That's gonna attract flies, that could pass on infection. Um, people just picking stuff up. I would have people avoid sick people picking any of the medicines up because once again, it's on the bottle and get moved around. 
So environmental sanitation, meaning keeping your first aid area as clean as you can and making sure you have a wash station for yourself and other people. A simple wash station, maybe I, can, I have some photographs and maybe John will post them of just of a small foot pump because it's better if you have a foot pump to then get water and soap on your hands so you don't have to touch a lot of stuff because if you're holding a soap bottle and putting it in your hand and putting a soap bottle back, that soap bottle potentially is contaminated as well as anything else you touch in between people. So I think that's basically the idea is personal sanitation, environmental sanitation. Uh, consider your patients. If they have diarrhea, they might have messy pants. And it, how are they going to change it? What if they don't have other pants? Like how are you going to really maintain some reasonable amount? We're not talking about sterilization here. We're just talking about basic sanitation so that you can prevent infection from spreading. We'll talk also a bit about that with education. Mm -hmm.